this is our second attempt to do uh, something called uh, On Target. And uh, On Target is an endeavor that we uh, put together uh, to bring issues to hand that no one will talk about, no one will discuss on uh, regular television. And if they do, it's out of context. And it, so you really lose concept of what they're talking about. Uh, we're going to attempt today something that's uh, pretty audacious, actually. Why are we, I guess, qualified to do this? Well, we've been doing independent news now for about five years. And we've seen, uh, been on the sets with all of these people and, and, and covered uh, presidents and so on uh, at distances and interviewed people up close. So we've probably done enough to know what's good and what isn't. As a result, I'm joined today with uh, our always stalwart uh, investigative reporter, Larry Gilbert. And behind the camera is uh, uh, my lovely bride, Donna Winship. And uh, the three of us are going to really discuss issues today and look at issues today that you would never, never see anywhere. So what is the issue today? Well, uh, the on-target program today will put in the crosshairs uh, anchor news. How did it start? Why do we have it? And what's happened to it today? It's a big, big project, and we invite you to be uh, coming back to this uh, website and uh, watching uh, a variety of the, There's so much to cover in this issue that, that I'm sure that you'll want to come back and look at this program again and again. And we invite you to certainly do that. At any rate, we'll start off uh, today talking about the anchor about what is an anchor, how did they get in charge of our lives, telling us what the news of the day is, and I guess the only way to, to start with that is to start with the history and the background. So Larry, you want to start off with telling us what's going on here? Yes, Ron, and uh, you're right, this is a very in-depth and complex subject, and we're going to be looking back over 50 years. Uh, the first TV news program was in 1962, and it ran for all of 15 minutes on CBS. Right. And now we've got news 24-7. In fact, uh, three major cable news programs, as we've researched it, have 371 anchors today. And uh, one of the things that I have to commend the FCC for was way back in that time frame, they recognized the concern we have about media bias. And when there's going to be controversial subjects of public interest, they mandated a fairness doctrine which was to give equal uh, opportunity to both sides of the issues. What year was that? And the Fairness Doctrine was in 1949, so we're going back quite a bit in time. Whatever happened to the Fairness Doctrine? And unfortunately, during the deregulation during the Reagan years, there was some concern that it may be a violation of the First Amendment, so uh, it was never put into effect. Okay, let's let's start with some things here that, that we might uh, try to grasp where, that, where all this started. Actually, news anchors and the effect of uh, news reporters on our lives actually started back in uh, around 1932 with the with FDR, and uh, we had some incredible writers of the time. We had uh, Joseph Alsop, and we had uh, 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 who, who else were we were talking about uh, that were some of the some of the uh, great writers in those days. Well, I know we were, we were looking at. You know, uh, Edward R. Murrow, Pearson, Drew Pearson. Right. Well, Edward R. Murrow didn't come on the scene until after World War II. He was later. Yeah. But we had Walter Winchell, which was a good morning Mr. and Mrs. America, and it was a very important thing. And Drew Pearson was one of the best editorial writers in the country, and I think he was more conservative than the other ones were. And uh, Joseph Alsop was more of a communist, a libertarian, <laughs> whatever he was. At any rate, all of these guys had their own agendas, and they were getting, they had their own uh, connections with the White House. They had insider information and it started with them doing that. Well, nothing has much changed in all these years and, and as a result uh, of that, this history of, uh, of uh, New Year's anchors was uh, uh, started, as you said, 1962, uh, uh, shortly after the, what was it, the 56 or the 60 convention, uh, political convention. They had both conventions on television back in those days. Used to watch it in black and white, used to see uh, that was the first time we ever got to see the uh, Goldwater Girls, I think, and uh, we—that's when uh, 1960 was it, or was that was that later? That was later, 64. But but at any rate, it was a uh, it was uh, that was the year 60 was Nixon and and uh, Kennedy, and uh, there was a a lot of news 
anchors of the times, uh, Roger Mudd and uh, Chet Huntley and Brinkley. And Brinkley, and we and, had uh, uh, Douglas Edwards and then Walter Cronkite. Douglas Edwards with the news was very big, and all these guys Edward were all with them. And there were so few of them that we got to see, because television was sort of, sort of a new medium. True. And uh, so we got to rely on them when they said something, we kind of listened to them, and we knew that they weren't going to lie to us. We trusted them. We trusted him, but there was, there was a, as, as Reagan always said, as a believe but verify aspect to this. The government, the actual government, the sitting government, if if any news anchor in those days said anything improper, they were they were chastised and castigated and cast out. And so they realized that there was always that sort of Damocles hanging over what they had to say on uh, television or on radio. And uh, as a result, that's uh, they did. They did the. It was always had decorum. We didn't have yelling and screaming and a variety of other things going on. And so, at any rate, uh, with Walter Cronkite, uh, we had, as I said, Douglas Brinkley and uh, Huntley and Brinkley. And Remember John Cameron Swayze? With and his John Cameron Swayze, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Take the watch yeah. on the water. <laughs> yeah, he's the one that started on ABC with the uh, wide, wide world of sports. At any rate, these were guys that we believed in, and we believed in them because. Uh, day in, day out, they were approved by the powers of be. Right. They didn't okay. have agendas. Right. Well, that brought us to the um, Vietnam era. And uh, in the Vietnam era was the first, uh, they call it the first television war. And some of the old guys that had been on television up to that point uh, that were local news guys that had covered World War II, uh, that was sort of the end times for uh, Edward R. Murrow. Uh, but they had Walter Cronkite again. They had Cleet Roberts, was a famous news correspondent in World War II. They had some people that were, you know, that you could trust. And then you had a whole bunch of new guys that came out to cover this Vietnam War. And uh, uh, I never got to see Al Gore when he was a news guy for the Army. Did you see him? No. You know, I never saw him either. And I don't <coughs> think anybody else did. But what happened was in during the Vietnam War is they were, uh, they, they had that famous cliche, if it bleeds, it leads, and so they wanted to show a lot of dead bodies, and they wanted to show a lot of dead American soldiers, they wanted to show uh, uh, Vietnamese generals shooting uh, captives uh, on television, they wanted it to be dramatic, they wanted it to be uh, very, uh, 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 well, just theater, basically, to scare the heck out of people, that, and what that did, of course, was fuel the anti-war movement right. in the United States. So, tell us about what you thought. What you thought about the Vietnam era with uh, with news anchors and so on? Well, I think we've seen it with you know with Jane Fonda, and she's still apologetic today. No, she wasn't a news anchor, but, uh, but, but you know her involvement. In, her she was sort of like the big first um, celebrity. Asian, you right, know, she was celebrity yeah. involved in it. Okay, but it did uh, change the way uh, the government has to deal with the public here because the perception, if um, you know, if we had the same kind of coverage in the Second World War, I don't know what would have happened. Uh, you know, it's a question about withholding information and when you need to be uh, sharing that information on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, they were there. Uh, I don't know how much control was uh, placed on them by what they could report and send out, but they did get the word out about what was happening. Well, they got the word out. I disagree with well, the word. What they did was that, that, if you'll recall, and I think this is the sad story of Vietnam and the news reporting, by the way. Uh, is that everybody forgets that Robert Strange McNamara was running the war. And he happened to have uh, a guy, uh, a general there, Westmoreland, who did anything that he wanted just to keep his job. This is stuff that was never reported on TV. We were happened, I happened to be serving in the Army at the time, so I was a little bit aware, I was uh, trying to save my life in this whole process. But the, the concept was that, that they would send guys out on search and destroy missions, and uh, then they try to, you know, if, if everyone has seen uh, Full Metal Jacket and about the Marines, those are Marines, I'm an Army guy, but, you know, the, the process was the same, and it was very true. And uh, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to see blood trails and dead bodies and show that they were, we were killers and living a life of danger. And uh, this was all big theater, and we were going to win this war and so on. But with the bad strategy proposed by... Robert Strange, McNamara, LBJ, uh, it wasn't ever going to fly. And uh, when Nixon got elected, it didn't do any better other than he bombed northern, you know, north, uh, the north uh, 
uh, and uh, brought Jane Fond out to sit behind some anti-aircraft tank or air aircraft gun and say, I'm so glad we shoot <coughs> down Americans every day. You know, I mean, it was a very bad time because it was bad strategy by the part of the, of the White House. It was uh, terrible. And uh, we were just doing our job trying to live and get back home in time for dinner. But it never, it was a, it was a tough time. And so Vietnam, they finally, after the Tet Offensive, when we actually won that battle, that's when Cronkite came out on the uh, TV and said, we've lost the war. And uh, that was his point of view. I didn't hear anybody elect him to tell us that we lost the war. Uh, I didn't hear any of the, there, was a, there were a lot of uh, congressmen and senators that were saying that we'd lost the war. Uh, there were a lot of uh, other people, but to actually have a news anchor say that we'd lost the war, we'd never had that happen in our history before. So he did a really, I think, a really bad thing by taking it off the plate of, uh, of, of journalism and putting it onto the plate of editorializing. Right. And that's where this whole, uh, what do you call it, uh, from small uh, oaks, uh, tall oaks grow, or from small uh, acorns, tall oaks grow. And, and we're talking about that was a bad thing that they did. So let's move on to something that, that they did, the, the, the media did, that was actually pretty good. And that was reporting on Watergate. How did that happen? Interesting story. I guess it goes back to June of 71 with the uh, Pentagon Papers. Uh, there was a RAND secret plan talking about what they thought, and this is a think tank, as to uh, what would happen. This is the RAND involved. Corporation, and they had secret papers about what? About Vietnam? Well, what happened is that Daniel Ellsberg was a Defense Department analyst. Okay. And they um, they broke into a psychiatrist's office for some reason. Yeah, what is, I'm trying to discredit him, I guess. Okay. Because he was uh, trying to leak information that would be. Was he a homosexual, or do we ever know that? Uh, that that part I didn't research. Nobody ever got nobody got to research that. Okay, go ahead. But in any event, uh, then we ended up um, a couple of months later the plumbers burglarizing the office, as I said earlier. Okay, now who were the plumbers for those people that weren't around then? Uh, these were former uh, CIA. That were um, employed by who? I think uh, directly or indirectly President Nixon at the time. Okay, so the President Nixon was so uh, paranoid, schizophrenic, and with good purpose. I mean, he had uh, he had a, there was an independent. What everybody misses in this time frame, uh, uh, tragically, is the fact that uh, there was an <coughs> independent uh, candidate running for office in '68 and in '72. And uh, his name was George Wallace. He was obviously from the South. He was obviously uh, not uh, particularly uh, uh, unbiased in his, his approach to uh, race issues. Uh, but he was a very cons fiscal conservative, which scared both of the candidates, the Democrats and the Republicans, because they wanted to spend a lot of money at that time. At any rate, so we're talking about a time when we had a lot of anti-war vitriol going on with Nixon. He was paranoid schizophrenic that everything was going against him, which was probably true because he'd made a real big en enemy out of J. Edgar Hoover, who we just recently found out uh, because of the, uh, the recent discovery of who the real uh, deep throat was, right? Mm -hmm. True. Uh, but we'll get into that in a minute. So go ahead and go on from there. Well, we ended up in June where uh, John Mitchell Part of his administration was in denial, and we're not doing anything wrong. You, John Mitchell was the Attorney General of the United States at that time? That's correct. All right. And then uh, fast forward till January of 73, and G. Gordon Liddy <coughs> was convicted of conspiracy. And that's just the beginning, because three months later, we have Halderman and Ehrlichman. They resign over the scandal. These are all his usual suspects, right? right? The inner circle. Right. The inner circle. His pals. Um, his White House counsel, uh, John D. was fired. Finally, because uh, he was going to become a whistleblower. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's justified. Yeah, so he was. A, he was